we're going to be continuing and in fact ending what has been a wonderful series as we've been looking at hope. And I want to say this, if you've missed any of our talks, you can catch them online. Uh, you can do so on our YouTube channel and uh, do subscribe and hit that like button. And it's worth saying at this point, hello to all of you guys online. Uh, you may be watching here uh, on Sunday morning, but equally we know many catch up during the week. And here's a thought, if you're at home watching this now, you can make it for the 11.30 service. So come on, get out those PJs, get on over. I promise you some donuts and a coffee, so do come along. Okay, but we're going to look at hope, and uh, what a better time to look at hope than on Resurrection Sunday, hey? Um, It's just a wonderful thing, and and as I mentioned earlier in my prayer, you know, we come together to remember the events of Easter Sunday, don't we? But, you know, we need to recognise that it's more about remembering the events that happened 2,000 years ago, it's about reflecting on the truth of what it means for us 2,000 years later, And the truth is this, there is hope in the resurrection of Christ. Because if we only had Good Friday, well, quite frankly, we wouldn't be here, would we? If the story ended on Good Friday, well, we wouldn't be calling it good for a start, would we? It would be called Bad, Bad, Bad Friday. But we call it Good Friday because we know the end of the story. And that's why we're here celebrating. And what I'd like to do this morning is I'd like us to read the account of the empty tomb. And then I'm going to look at three hopes that we can place in, in the empty tomb, in the resurrection of Christ, 2,000 years later, here in Hertfordshire. So you can turn with me, if you wish, to Luke 24. I'm going to read from verses 1 to 11. Uh, It's going to be on the screen as well, if you're in the room, if you're online, it'll be on your device. And let's read this account together. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. When they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. What wonderful words. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day, rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. Now, it was Mary Magdalene and and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostle. (laughs) But these words seemed to them an idle tale. Gotta love that language. Say what? That's more than paraphrasing. What? Don't be so silly. Stop telling me an idle tale. (laughs) And they did not believe them. I mean, you can imagine. What? It's empty, no chance. But, don't you love it when there's a but? Peter rose and ran to the tomb. You can just imagine Peter, can't you? (gasps) Oh my word, this could be it. This could be true. Stooping and looking in, what did he see? Did he see the body of Jesus laying there? No. What did he see? The linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Amen. What an account. And so within this story, within the truth of these events and the message that it gives to us 2,000 years later, let's look at three pieces of hope for us in this present day. Are you ready for number one? Trust me, this is good news. Our sins are washed away. Yeah, amen. Let's be Pentecostal in the house. Amen. Preach it, brother. (laughs) Our sins are washed away. Let's read this together. Hebrews 10, 10 to 12. This is from the New Living Translation. 
Our sins, says the writers of Hebrews, are washed away and we are made clean. Anybody want to be made clean in the house? Because Christ gave his own body as a gift to God. He did this once for all time. Man, there's just so much in that that we could preach on for many weeks. But you know, isn't it interesting that sin is, is not a very popular word, is it? In fact, I think it be, can be almost a word that brings offence. What do you mean I'm sinning? How dare you? There is no absolute truth. Uh, this is my truth, eh? Truth has become subjective. But there is sin. And what does sin actually mean? Well, it means missing the mark. It simply means missing the mark. And as it says in the Scriptures, we have all fallen short. We've all missed the mark of what? Your, your neighbour who's really good? No. The person who got the MBE for good works? No, that's not the mark. Maybe Mother Teresa. Maybe we've missed the mark and we should be like Mother Teresa. No, I'm sorry. The mark is the glory of God. So stop comparing us. We've got to stop comparing ourselves. Well, I'm a pretty good guy, you know. I give to charity. I've got to tell you, being good is not going to get you to heaven. It's not about how good you are. It's about whether you have a relationship re restored with a father who loves you. And you see, the problem with sin, missing the mark, means that there's a barrier between us and God, us and a holy God. So what does God do to solve this sin problem? You know, sin came in with the pride of Adam and Eve, the rebellion, and we're born into that. Our, our, our nature, we call it, we're born into a sinful nature. You know, there is within us this sense of rebellion against God. So how did God solve the sin problem? Did he say, you know what, I've decided, I've had a bit of a confab with Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit, and we've decided, we voted for it, actually, we don't mind the fact there's sin. We've decided it's okay. Did he say that? No. Or did he say, I cannot believe these silly human beings. I'm going to wipe them out completely and I'll start again. Did he say that? No. He made a way. And the way he made a way was that he sent his only son. In fact, this is probably the most famous of verses in the Bible. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? Thank you. John 3.16. For God so loved the world... That he what? Sent his only begotten son, that whoever will believeth in him will not, but have life. I mean, that's the good news. And you see, Jesus dying on the cross, what did he do in that moment? He bore our sin. He took the punishment that was due you and me. He said, you know what? They can't work their way out of this predicament. And maybe you're here this morning and think, well, I love God. I'm a good person. Listen, it's not about works. I've said this before, and my kids are in for the first time when I say this. So, uh, hello, children. Hear the heart of which daddy gives this. But my neighbor's kids are better than these kids in terms of their behavior. <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> they don't shout and scream like these guys. I love you so much. <laughs> but that, those neighbor's kids are not going to get my inheritance. They are. It doesn't matter if they come over and say, Mr. Halvagin, would you like your car washed? Yes, please. They're not going to get my inheritance. Why? Because they're not my children. Are you seeing this? Are you hearing this? You see, going to heaven, eternity with Christ, eternity with the Father, is not about performing your way there. It's about being adopted into the family and recognizing that Jesus has done it all for you. And that deserves an amen right there. And so I want to say this morning, I've got good news for you. The hope of the fact that Jesus rose again is this, that your sins, those things that cause a barrier between you and God, are washed away. As far as the east is from the west, so are our transgressions from him. That gives us hope. But you know, there's more than that. Really? Wow, that's amazing. Yes, there is. Because we all know that sin has its stuff with it. What does it have? Guilt? Shame? What was that? 
Something fell over, did it? Okay, we're all safe? Good. Okay. Um, Yes, we know that when you sin, well, those things, you know what are bad. You know, what comes in? Guilt and shame. And you have to live with that. And oftentimes, wow, look at this. Lots is going on this morning. This is going to be fun, isn't it? Uh, You can see me okay, presumably. Oh, we're back. Um, But here's the good news, you see. You don't have to live in that place of guilt and shame. And as humans, what we try and do with that guilt and shame is that we try and self-medicate ourselves. What do I mean by that? We try and feed us things that will cover over the guilt, whether that be alcohol or whether that be the things that we watch, whether that be the thought patterns we get in. We try our best to cover over the impact of sin, but I've got great news for you. Not only has Jesus cleansed us of that sin so that we can have relationship with God the Father, he's cleansed you of that sin so you can walk in freedom and restoration and be cleansed from the guilt and the shame. That is hope. That is the message and the truth of Resurrection Sunday. Okay, should we move on to number two? Okay, let's do this. Number two. He pauses for dramatic effect. Death is not the end. Hallelujah. You know, a number of years ago, many years ago, I happened to be in Beijing for a business trip. And uh, I decided to go visit Tiananmen Square. Anyone been to Tiananmen Square? Yeah, a number of you. I mean, it's a massive place. It's quite impactful. And in Tiananmen Square is a, a, is a, a memorial hall where Chairman Mao is encased where uh, he's surrounded by these guards, and you can go and view this embalmed corpse of Chairman Mao. Now, I have to admit, I didn't go to look at Chairman Mao. I didn't feel the need to, or, but not that that's a bad thing to do so. I mean, history is a good thing, of course. But here's the thing about Chairman Mao. Chairman Mao came, and some of you will know your history, in 1960s in China with the promise of a utopian society, didn't he, with perfect social order. And so he instigated from that ideology the cultural revolution. Now, what happened with the cultural revolution? Did utopia come? No. What came was death, starvation, persecution. It's estimated that between 40 to 80 million people died during the cultural revolution, the great leap forward. This man came with the promise of hope. And when he died... What did he leave his followers? No hope. You see, the presence of his lifeless corpse was evidence that there was no hope in his promises. About 30 years ago, I went to another place of memorial. This time it was in Israel, and I went to the tomb of Jesus. And when I walked in there, Did I see a lifeless corpse? I saw an empty tomb. Are you seeing this? Are you you seeing this? You see, Chairman Mao's hope was hopeless because there was no hope after death. But you see, what Jesus showed, what the empty tomb shows us is that death is not the end. (laughs) Why do you think there's gazillions upon millions of people for 2,000 years that have followed Jesus? What was it that took those disciples who were despondent and in fear and scared of their life to be bold and courageous and proclaim the gospel to the ends of the world? What happened in that moment? The hope that death was not the end. Now, you might say, well, hold on a minute, Mark. I mean, you're, of course, based now on on an assumption that Jesus rose from the dead. Yes, I am. I am. You know, in the Scriptures, you know, the Bible, there's a a science called textual criticism, and it analyzes the authenticity of a piece of written work with two things. Number one, how many copies of the original manuscripts were written and what the time duration was between the originals and when those copies were made. Who here believes in Roman history and the Caesars and all that stuff? Why? Because we read all the historical accounts. Did you know that there's more copies of the Bible than those historical accounts 
and a closer amount of time before the originals and when this was written. So I'd rather suggest to you that if you want to believe about the history of the Romans, then you rather should believe what's written in this word. And here's the other fact. Now, if I said to you, by the way, King Charles is staying in a hotel near where I live, you'd say, man, that man's balmy. I said, I saw the king. No, you didn't. But what if over 500 people said, yeah, I saw him? I mean, that would hold up in a, in a court, wouldn't it? Did you know that Jesus appeared to over 500 people after he was risen? And that is why we can have certainty in the truth and the fact that Jesus was alive and he walked in, a, in bodily form. Now, that is good news for us because I would like to read to you um, from 1 Corinthians. This is the Apostle Paul who wrote to the church in Corinth. And he says this in chapter 15, 20 to 22. He says this, but in fa fact, Christ has been risen from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, who was that? Adam, we're all born into the line of Adam. We're born into that, as I mentioned earlier, that sinful nature. Our destination, our default destination is not heaven. By a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. And as he clarifies for us in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all made alive. You see, Christ was the first fruits. You know, when they used to go and harvest and bring in the harvest, they would get the first fruits first to check if everything was okay. Jesus has gone there before you and he's risen and he says, it's a-okay if you believe in me, you're gonna rise yourself. I mean, that deserves another hallelujah. I mean, maybe you're sitting here and you're fearful of death. You're saying, I don't wanna die. I wanna tell you this, it does not need to be the end because Jesus has gone before you and he rose again and that is the promise. That is the hope of Resurrection Sunday. And that leads me as I bring this plane into hopefully a very smooth landing. The third point, are you with me? Jesus is with us now. Let's read some scripture, shall we? This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church um, in Galatia. In Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. So the Apostle Paul is saying, oh, listen, I died with Christ. And I'll explain that in a moment. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, in other words, the life I now lead in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, we have these wonderful baptismal candidates here. And in a moment, they're gonna go in what hopefully is some warm water. I don't think it's gonna be warm. <laughs> Feel for Edward and I, we're gonna be in there for the whole time, right? They're gonna go in that waters. And what is baptism? It is a symbolic act of what? Dying, going under the waters, dying with Christ, and coming up a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's what this is about. It's about a declaration and a profession of faith to say, you know what, I identify with what the Apostle Paul wrote because I am dying with Christ. What does that mean? The old self, the fleshful desires, the old ways, they die with Christ on the cross and the good news is I am risen again into new life, eternity with him, a new creature in Christ Jesus. And that's the hope. Because I believe that deep down inside of us, each one of us, you know, we've been created to worship God. Did you know that? The question here for you this morning is not, are you worship, do you want to worship God? The question is, who are you worshiping other than God? Because if you don't worship God, you'll worship something else. Something else will take throne, throne in your heart. Maybe it's celebrity, maybe it's money, maybe it's status, maybe it's success. Maybe it's something else that you pursue why? Because as human beings, we've been created to worship and pour our adoration to God. And deep down, there is something inside of us that knows this is not it. Maybe you're here this morning and something is stirring in you and you've, you've never said yes to Jesus. And yet as I'm speaking, you're thinking, wait a minute, maybe there is something more to this than meets the eye. Maybe you're here this morning and maybe you're online watching this and you've lived a life where you feel hopeless. Maybe you can't walk under the weight 
of the shame and the guilt for the things you've done and the regret. I'm here to tell you that God, by sending his son to you, Jesus, has washed that away. You don't need to live with that anymore. Maybe you're here this morning and you're hopeless because you fear death. I want to tell you the good news of the resurrection is this. Jesus died again and so can you if you believe. Jesus rose again and you can rise with him again if you believe in him. That is good news. And lastly, that you can walk this life not alone, but with the power of the Holy Spirit in you, walking in the life of Christ. I'd like us all to pray as I end.